Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, if you're new to us, if you would if you would mute yourself so that uh, we can we can uh, it'll just be the speaker. Um, before we get started tonight, um, a couple of things we want to do it's um, is thank our sponsors, uh, Cape Cod Five, First Citizens Federal Credit Union, uh, Martha's Vineyard Savings. And like all of our uh, author series books in um, on our uh, Safer at Home series, all every book is available at Eight Cousins Booksellers. So we wanted to make sure that you uh, um, honor the honor the locals and, and buy your book uh, uh, at from Eight Cousins. Um, if you're new to one of our series, what we try to do is um, uh, when we have questions at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the chat feature. Um, so um, when our speaker, speaker gets done, you can type your questions in there. And um, uh, so uh, we'll use the chat feature. Make sure you mute yourself um, so everybody can hear that. Um, and I'm, I'm, I think it's really cool that our speaker is doing this tonight from London, where it's midnight his time. And to his everlasting credit, John Dickey said, I got because I asked him, I said, do you want to do this at, at a time that's easier for you? And he said, no, 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 that we can do this at seven o'clock um, Eastern time, because this gives me good practice for staying up for the Super Bowl, um, or as we call around here, the Tom Brady Invitational. Um, so, uh, so he's, he's going to, He's, he's going to stay. So this is this is a practice for him. Our, our speaker, John Dickey, is a professor of Italian studies at University College in London. Um, he has been uh, a recognized specialist on many aspects of Italian history, including doing a book on the Cosa Nostra. So he's uh, um, so this is a little bit of a different topic for him. Um, but he's uh, very familiar with uh, with this kind of thing. So would you welcome our speaker tonight, um, John Dickey? Hello, everybody. Uh, very nice to meet you all virtually. Um, let me dive straight in so I can leave as much time for uh, questions and discussion afterwards, which, of course, is always uh, uh, the best bit. What is Freemasonry? Um, it's a sworn brotherhood of men, originally and still typically only men, primarily men, who are together dedicated to a program of self-improvement. And the chief means of self-improvement they use are rituals in which symbols stand for moral qualities. The rituals are, if you like, miniature moral dramas that the Masons act out. Now, vast numbers of symbols are used uh, in these rituals. Masons, through their history, have hoovered up more and more symbols to use from all kinds of cultures and folklores and so on to use in their rituals. Um, but the original and most important of these symbols come from the work of stonemasons, so pairs of compasses, squares, plumb lines, trowels, and the like. And the idea is, metaphorically speaking, that the Freemasons build better men as the stonemasons of old once built castles or cathedrals. Now, so far, so straightforward and so sort of ordinary. Um, in a sense. But what really galvanizes Freemasonry, and particularly galvanizes its history, I think, makes it fascinating and surprising, pushes it in all kinds of strange, unexpected directions across three or four hundred years of global history, is secrecy. Now, when you become a Mason, you undergo a secret ceremony in which you swear to protect certain secrets with your life, secrets which are further enveloped in secrecy by being hidden behind uh, symbols. So what are the secrets? Why all the secrecy? Do they really mean it? Can we trust a group that is so determined to keep things hidden from us? Now, in my book, I do explain, and I do it pretty early on, 
uh, what the uh, what the secrets of Freemasonry are. But this is a book which is not an expose. Um, there is actually much, much more to Masonic secrecy than what the, the content of the secrets is. And you can find out the contents of those secrets with a little bit of Googling. Um, so to try and explain uh, why secrecy is, Masonic secrecy is fascinating, why it might have generated uh, uh, so many, uh, so much of the book, so much of the history that fascinates me. Uh, I wanted to read you the very beginning of the book um, from a chapter called um, uh, John Kustos's Secrets. This is the very beginning, and it kind of takes us in medias res. It, it, it takes us into the middle of what was happening to Freemasons and into the, into the middle of this issue um, of secrecy. So here we go. On the 14th of March, 1743, as he was leaving a Lisbon coffee, ha coffee house, John Kustos, a 40-year-old jeweller from London, was grabbed, handcuffed, and bundled into a chaise. A short time later, he found himself in one of the most feared buildings in Europe. Looming at the northern end of Rossio Square, the Estaus Palace housed the Portuguese headquarters of the Holy Office of the Inquisition. Just like hundreds of witches, heretics and Jews who had been brought there before him, Kustos had his scalp shaved and was stripped naked save for his linen undergarments. Confined in a dungeon, he was subjected to a meticulous regime. Isolation and silence were rigidly enforced. A fellow prisoner with a persistent cough was cudgelled into unconsciousness. No communication with friends and relatives was permitted, no possessions, no books, not even a Bible, nothing that would interrupt the voice of divine conscience, nothing to block out the prisoner's all too vivid imagining of the horrors that awaited him in the Inquisition's auto da fe. This grand spectacle of religious justice was a procession culminating in prayers, incantations, and public execution by one of two methods. The mercy of strangling for those who embraced the Catholic faith at the last minute, and for the obstinate, the unutterable torment of the flames. Kustos tells us that the inquisitors initially questioned him in a spiritually nurturing tone. Nonetheless, he had the clear sense that his replies were futile. Eventually, he was summoned from his cell and brought before the president of the Holy Office, who read out the charges as if talking to a wall. that he has infringed the Pope's orders by his belonging to the sect of the Freemasons. This sect being a horrid compound of sacrilege, sodomy, and many other abominable, cri abominable crimes, of which the inviolable secrecy observed therein and the exclusion of women were but two manifest indications, a circumstance that gave the highest offence to the whole kingdom. And the said Kustos, having refused to discover to the Inquisitors the true tendency and design of the meeting of the Freemasons, and persisting on the contrary in asserting that Freemasonry was good in itself, Wherefore, the proctor of the Inquisition requires that the said prisoner may be prosecuted with the utmost rigour. And for this purpose, 
desires the court would exert its whole authority and even proceed to tortures. Custus was taken to a square, windowless room in a tower. Quilted padding lined the door to deaden the sound of screaming from within. A doctor and a surgeon looked back at him from the shadows. The only light came from two candles on the desk at which the tribunal's secretary sat waiting to record his confession. Four burly men seized him and clamped him to a horizontal rack by closing an iron collar around his neck. They fitted rings with ropes attached to his feet and yanked his limbs to their fullest extent. Then eight loops of cord, two over each arm and two over each leg, were passed through the frame and fed out into the torturer's hands. Kustos felt the cords tighten and tighten and finally start to soar through flesh. Blood spattered the floor beneath him. If he died in this torment, he was told, only his own obstinacy would be to blame. Between his own cries, he heard the Inquisitor pose the questions he'd already heard many times. What is Freemasonry? What are its constitutions? What goes on in lodge meetings? Eventually, he fainted and was carried back to the dungeons. Six weeks later, the Inquisitors tried again with a different method, the dreaded strapado. Upright this time, Kustos had his arms gradually stretched back behind him, palms facing outwards until the backs of his hands met. Then his arms were pulled slowly upwards until his shoulders were levered from their sockets and blood poured from his mouth. As he beseeched heaven for patience, the inquisitors persisted with their questions. Is Freemasonry a religion? Do you not, why do you not admit women? Is it because you are sodomites? When the doctors had reset his bones and he'd spent two months recovering, the torture resumed. This time a chain was wound around his torso and attached to his wrists. Pulleys drew the chain ever tighter, squeezing his insides and dislocating his wrists as well as his shoulders. Why all the secrecy in Freemasonry? What do you have to hide? Kustos tells us that he spent 16 months in total in the dungeons of the Estaus Palace and endured nine bouts of torture before the time finally came for him to be paraded through the streets in the Alto da Fe of the 21st of June, 1744. But he was lucky. While eight of his fellow prisoners were burned alive at the climax of the procession, he was condemned to, condemned to four years as a galley slave. The relative freedom this sentence afforded him gave him the chance to contact friends who mobilized the British government to obtain his release. When he reached London on the 15th of December, 1744, he set to writing his story, but he'd barely begun when the Jacobite rebellion of 1745 broke out. Bonnie Prince Charlie Stuart raised his standard in the highlands of Scotland, intent on enforcing his Catholic claim to the throne that had once been his grandfather's. The Jacobite army descended as far as Derby in the heart of England, sowing panic in London. Although it was eventually crushed, the rebellion revived the public appetite for books documenting the barbarities of the Roman church. The sufferings of John Kustos for Freemasonry, complete with engravings of all the tortures its author had endured, was published at the perfect moment. Kustos became a celebrity. The book was widely translated and remained in print well into the 19th century. Here was a martyr for Freemasonry and its inviolable secrecy except that things did not quite go in the way Kustos said. 
Over two centuries later, the Inquisition's transcription of his interrogation surfaced from the Lisbon archives to reveal that he did give away the mysteries of Freemasonry that he'd vowed to die to protect. Very sensibly, faced with the prospect of the torture chamber and the auto da fe, he told all. Indeed, he barely waited for the inquisitors to open their mouths before answering all their questions. Not that his confession saved him from being tortured. Portuguese inquisitors rarely needed much of an excuse to break out the instruments of pain. They racked Custos twice for a little over 15 minutes each time, just to make sure. But he was never subjected to the strapado or the nameless torture with a chain wound around his torso. Something else that Kustos neglected to tell his readers is that, had the Lisbon Inquisitors looked hard enough, they could have found published sources that would have taught them what they wanted to know. Like Sam Pritchard's pamphlet Masonry Dissected of 1730. Exposés of free, Freemasonry are nearly as old as Freemasonry itself. Masonic secrets have never really been all that secret. Kustos evidently found the temptation to pass himself off as a hero just too strong. So once back at liberty, he doctored his story to perpetuate a beguiling myth. The idea that Freemasons are the bearers of some momentous or dangerous truth to which only the chosen few can have access and which they are bound by oath to safeguard and at any cost. Freemasonry's inviolable secrecy, as the Inquisitors called it, is elusive and powerful. It is the engine of the fascination and suspicion that have always surrounded the Freemasons. It inspires loyalty and attracts trouble. Secrecy is a game, and both Kustos and the Inquisitors were caught up in it. Yet, as I think John Kustos appreciated, secrets are not as important to Freemasonry as stories about Freemasonry. Secrecy is the key to Masonic history in that, if we can grasp it, we can unlock a rich store of narratives about how the world we live in was made. So that's how the book begins. Um, and from that point, I um, try to open up... Uh, a history and explain why I find it so fascinating. And the, 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 the first thing is what I've called the paradoxical virtues of Freemasonry. Freemasonry was born, really owes its birth, I think, to the kind of values we associate with the Enlightenment, the same values that are embodied in the, um, the Constitution of the, the United States, uh, for example those of ra religious, racial, and social tolerance. In theory, Freemasonry welcomes men from any background. It is cosmopolitan, and it has a doctrine of universal brotherhood. It, ha it also believes in a certain sort of formal equality f between all brothers, from whatever background they come. Um, yet, in this, if you like, aspiration to universality, one of the things that attracts me to Freemasonry is paradoxical, because of course, in this devotion to rational fraternal intercourse, Masonry is still based on these strange um, rituals. It's based also on exclusiveness, on a firm boundary drawn by oath, between insider and outsiders. These are universal values expounded for most of its history by a brotherhood that has excluded women and which in various times and places has become an instrument 
in struggles over religion, race, and social values, rather than the antidote to those tensions and struggles. So what fascinates me, I think, is, is the, 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 the interface, the interaction between this rather weird and arcane world of Freemasonry and the forces that have shaped world history over the last three centuries. So what my book does is to zoom in into various times and places. Each chapter carries the name of a city, for example, and I ro uh, roam the world in, um, uh, in pursuit of moments in Masonic history, which I can bring into focus with real people and a sense of place and, 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 and uh, in involving stories where uh, Freemasonry has had an important influence on the course of history and, and vice versa, where history has uh, influenced Freemasonry, but uh, broken into the, if you like, the utopian space of the Masonic Lodge. Um, the book begins uh, by recounting the origins of this very unusual and influential form of brotherhood. And that takes us firstly to Edinburgh and the, the court of the king, whose portrait you can see on the right there, James VI of Scotland, who in 1603 would become James I of England, uh, the first king to unite the two crowns. Um, and paving the way for the formation of the United Kingdom. Um, James I was an intellectual king. He was an expert, among other things, on witchcraft. He wrote a book that would become one of Shakespeare's uh, major sources for the witches in Macbeth. And at the court of King James, which was a Renaissance court, saw an almost sort of magical mixture between the culture of uh, James's elite stonemasons, the people who were building his palaces and chapels and that sort of thing, and the Renaissance intellectuals and statesmen of his court. And that was really the moment that created the opportunity for non-stonemasons to be attracted into this body. And they would, of course, gradually take it over uh, and turn the tools of the stonemasons trade, trade, uh, uh, trade into symbols rather than merely tools of the trade. But it was really in London uh, a century later that Freemasonry probably became codified and acquired a single governing body in 1717, the Grand Lodge. And it was from London, the, the capital of the empire, that's the frontispiece of the, the constitutions of 1723 that famously uh, drew up the first proper rule book uh, for Freemasonry uh, and was key to its being spread around the world because, of course, London was the capital of the British Empire, a hub of world trade, and it's from London that Freemasonry expanded around the world. Uh, uh, a certain printer called uh, Benjamin Franklin was the first person to publish those constitutions in uh, the United States, and he in turn became one of the major spreaders of Freemasonry um, in the New World and became an important figure in Freemasonry in France as well when he spent time where, there. And, and Freemasonry, in, sorry, in due course, the United States of America would become Freemasonry's most fertile soil. Um, the, but the book isn't just a history of Freemasonry. I, 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 it's a history of the Masonic idea, which I think is one of the most contagious ideas in the history of modernity. What's remarkable, this is an illustration from the 1730s celebrating the worldwide spread of Freemasonry. Already by this time, you had lodges in Turkey, in um, what is now Syria, in uh, India, in Calcutta, 
in the United, what would become the United States and the Americas in the Caribbean, as well as in mainland Europe and across uh, Great Britain, there was an astonishingly rapid spread of this idea. And over history, you know, it's a little, you know, in, in, a little bit like in some respects those, you know, in terms of being an example of British soft um, uh, power of sports like golf and tennis and soccer and so on, which from Britain have become sort of global sports over the course of the centuries. Um, and um, in the course of that global spread, Freemasonry span completely out of the control of its original uh, founders and its governing body, if you like, in um, uh, in London and became an influenced, reached into all kinds of other walks of unpredictable walks of life. Um, and so I, I, I trace the spread of that um, idea, if you like. So over the next two slides, I'm going to just um, uh, trace some of the ways in which Freemasonry was influential and which it has been influence. And the first, uh, I think, is a very important effort, is the attempt to use Freemasonry as a school of civic virtues, as a kind of non-denominational religion of state, of public uh, life. Um, and a pioneer in this sense was certainly George Washington, who, um, it, you know, in those, in the course of his presidency, um, his two terms, really had to design the institution of the presidency around his extremely prestigious person and picked on Freemasonry. He'd been a Freemason for a long time by that time um, as the sort of perfect fit for replacing the kind of the role that religion had, had had in public ceremonials in the monarchies of Europe, you know, the Te Deums, the coronations, all of those ceremonies which had help, in which established religion closely associated with the state in Europe, in Europe had given legitimacy and a sense of sort of divine mission to Europe's uh, states and monarchies. And Washington, when he chose to lay the cornerstone of the Capitol, um, uh, Capitol building in a very public and very well publicized Masonic ceremony, really set a trend for um, the way that the young republic would kind of speak to posterity uh, through Freemasonry, using Freemasonry with its code of religious tolerance and, and uh, uh, multi, its multi, its acceptance of multiple faiths, uh, you know, very quickly um, among the founders of Freemasonry in Britain, Freemasonry had accepted Catholic uh, Jews and Catholics and the different flavors of Protestantism, if you like, that were already uh, um, spreading in in uh, Great Britain at the time, and and the tolerance towards ca Catholics, as you'll have seen from the story of John Custos, was quite remarkable because Catholics were regarded as subversive, political subversives at the time. Um, so um, this is it. it like all um, men of his time, Washington realized that. Uh, republics didn't last. The, the lessons of history since classical times were unmistakable. And in the bid to shore up the legitimacy of the Republic and try to give it a long life, he adopted Freemasonry as a language of public ceremonial. But it wasn't just in the United States that this happened. The man uh, in the picture to the right, who you may not recognize, is Motilal Nehru, who was one of the, really the progenitors of Indian nationalism, the, the, one of the 
uh, major figures in the early history of the Indian National Congress, which is the political party that would guide India to independence from Britain, from the British Empire after the Second World War. Uh, the, the, the great interpreter of Indian national aspirations. This is a photo, I think, from the very early 1890s. And the little boy sitting at his father's feet there would grow in to become the first, into becoming the first prime minister of an independent India, the world's most numerous democracy. Now, um, like um, about half of the early leaders of the Indian National Congress were Freemasons. Um, and they saw in Freemasonry, like George Washington, a school of civic virtues, a way of teaching, oh, forgive me, a way of teaching Indians uh, uh, the, the virtues of life, sort of rule book of conducting meetings and behaving with impartiality and uh, uh, re mutual respect and formal respect to the rules. And also, of course, religious tolerance. Indian, in, Indian nationalists at that time recognized the big problem they faced was the cultural divide between Hindus and Muslims in India and Freemasonry seemed to offer a way of overcoming that. But Freemasonry has also uh, found that its values of tolerance have really been tested to destruction by many moments in glo the global history uh, to wh which it, it became part of. And I concentrate on two strands, really, uh, in which that happens in my, uh, throughout my book, again, which ranges across 300 years of history, more than 300 years of history. The first is the British Empire. Uh, this is a Masonic parade uh, with the Duke of Connaught, who was the Grand Master of the United Grand Lodge of England at the time, parading, showing off his Masonic credentials in Bulawayo, what is now Zimbabwe, which was then Rhodesia and firmly part of the British Empire. Freemasonry provided a support network for... Um, British imperialists on their travels around the world. One of the secrets of Freemasonry's success was mutual support. You contribute into a common fund and distressed Masons, the widows of Masons, can get support from the Brotherhood. But also Freemasonry, you know, gave um, uh, you know, a, an imperial soldier or an imperial dr bureaucrat traveling from, say, Canada to Australia to South Africa to India, um, a kind of home from home, uh, an instant social life, an instant network, but also Freemasonry's universal values repeatedly provided a kind of cover, cover story for imperialism. The idea was that, you know, the British weren't just conquering the world because they wanted to own large parts of it. It was they were doing it in the name of universal brotherhood and so on and so forth. So there's something, um, I think, fundamentally deceptive about the way uh, Masonic values were frequently invoked by Freemasons. Um, during the long history of the British Empire. And the other history is much more American. Um, despite Freemasonry's universal values, its embracing of relation, uh, racial and religious tolerance from the beginning, um, Freemasonry in America, right from the beginning, almost as long as there has been Freemasonry in America, has been racially divided between two distinct traditions. One, the mainstream white tradition, and one, the African-American Prince Hall tradition, which takes its name from its founder, uh, a Freemason called Prince Hall of uh, uh, Massachusetts Freedman, uh, um, who became a Mason in the 1780s, uh, we now think. Uh, that's a picture of a guy I interviewed, his uh, Howard University ring dis proudly displayed. Uh, he's a young historian of Freemasonry, 
uh, based in Washington, D.C. And you can see his Howard University ring and his uh, Masonic ring displayed at the same time. And that racial fissure in American Freemasonry is a really fascinating keyhole through which to observe uh, the long history of um, racial strife in the United States and, of course, the struggle for civil rights because of, although Freemasons have supposed to be, are supposed to be above politics, they swear not to be involved in politics, inevitably Prince Hall Freemasonry has played a very, very important role in the struggle, firstly against slavery. I tell the story of the 54th, famous 54th Massachusetts Regiment, the first regiment, uh, African-American Regiment of Freedmen, recruited after the uh, Emancipation Proclamation, uh, which was recruited um, primarily by Prince Hall Freemasons, and who many of whose um, non-commissioned officers were, were Prince Hall Freemasons. And the civil rights movement also was profoundly influenced by uh, uh, Prince Hall Freemasonry. Uh, Medgar Evers, for example, was a Prince Hall Freemason. Uh, there are many, many other examples. Um, and at the same time, I think the history of um, uh, white Freemasonry in America has been tainted by racism and even by white supremacy uh, in various moments of its history. So those are moments, if you like, when Freemasonry's um, values have been tested and found wanting by uh, the forces of history. Um, Freemasonry has also become a tool of power, used nakedly as a tool of power in the Napoleonic Empire, for example. Napoleon stuffed Masonic lodges with his officer, military officers and bureaucrats, made it a place for them to network and worship at the cult of the emperor. Uh, this is his brother-in-law, Joshi Murat, who became his, uh, uh, you know, Napoleon appointed as King of Naples when Napoleon conquered Southern Italy. That's the, that's Mount Vesuvius in the background that you can see smoking the volcano there. And Murat was also the Grand Master of the Grand Orient of Naples and like Napoleon filled his administration with Freemasons and filled his Masonic lodges with his military officers and with his ambitious bureaucrats, the new men who filled his offices. And that's a frequent, that's a pattern in many other times and places. Freemasons have also become a template for other organizations. The Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, is profoundly influenced by uh, Freemasonry uh, from its foundation in Upper New York State in um, the early 19th century. Um, uh, so its most important rituals, for example, are heavily based on Masonic rituals and its mythology and so on and so forth. Um, the Ku Klux Klan borrows the template of the Freemasonry. Most interestingly, beginning in southern Italy in the early 19th century under Murat and his successors, um, Italy's several mafia organizations, particularly the Sicilian mafia, are based on exactly the same template as the Sicilian Mafia. I tell the story, if you like, of how that template made its way from the political sphere into the criminal sphere in during the violent upheavals of Italian history in the early 19th century. That man you can see there in the green jersey in the center of the picture is Benedetto Capizzi, who in 2008 was the last man to aspire to the title of boss of all bosses of the Sicilian Mafia. I'm pleased to say he was arrested um, um, 
as were every, all the other members of the uh, Sicilian Mafia's ruling commission at the time. Um, the, the, the man, as it happens, next to him in the peak cap, uh, then Colonel uh, Manucci, now General Manucci, is a, a friend of mine. I've worked a lot on the Sicilian Mafia. I know a lot of people involved in fighting it. Um, but the Sicilian Mafia, uh, like its uh, um, American sister organization, is a sworn secret brotherhood like the Masons. Members of Mafia organizations join families. The term is a metaphor. It doesn't mean they're all related. It's a metaphor for how closely knit they are together. It doesn't mean they're all uncles and cousins and so on. And those families, those cells of the organization are like Masonic lodges, but like becoming a member of Ma Masonic Lodge, you also become a member of a wider network with contacts, well, can contact particularly across the Atlantic, and that's one of the secrets of the Sicilian Mafia's success. And like the Masons, it has blood curdling initiation, oaths and rituals and so on. It's unmistakably, uh, the Sicilian Mafia stole the Masonic template, if you like. Freemasonry has also got a lot of important role in making manhood, making what it means to be a man, particularly a middle class man, uh, a model of respectability, if you like, in various times and places across the world. In the book, I tell the story of this particular uh, person, the Chevalier Dion, um, who uh, an 18th century spy uh, sword uh expert if you like expert sword uh, diplomat expert sword fighter scandalist who uh joined the freemasons and then subsequently went about uh dressing as a woman and it's still you know difficult to know what contemporary term uh we might apply to the chevalier uh, deon but became something of a cause celebre at the time causing Freemasons to question what it meant to be a man and their rules of exclusivity and uh, other cases do the same thing that I tell in the book. And of course, um, the, the Freemasonry has generated conspiracies. It's been the model for uh, many revolutionary conspiracies, despite the Masonic taboo on uh, on politics, Masonic lodges in various times and places have become hubs of political conspiracy, of revolutionary conspiracy, because if you can, you know, revolutionaries need to maintain loyalty and secrecy, and what better way to do that than the, the kind of mechanisms of loyalty and secrecy created by the Freemasons. That man, I don't know if any of you recognize um, him, is Licio Gelli, um, who was the venerable master of the most notorious Masonic Lodge of them all, the P2 Masonic Lodge in Italy, which was mixed up in all kinds of corruption and terrorism and blackmail and money laundering for the mafia uh, and so on and so forth. Those terracotta pots uh, would subsequently be revealed to contain lots of gold bars, uh, the illicit profits of uh, Lucio Gelli's uh, dealings, and I tell the story of how he turned this particular Masonic Lodge, P2, or Propaganda Due, as it's called, into uh, the most notorious Masonic conspiracy of all time. But just as conspiracies are part of Masonic history here and there, even more prevalent are the completely groundless conspiracy theories. They're uh, really the, the modern conspiracy theory, as we know it all too well, you know, those of you who've encountered QAnon and all of these kinds of things, the, the model for this idea 
this extremely contagious idea that there is a secret elite somehow working to control world affairs, the model is Freemasonry. And it was invented, the modern conspiracy theory was invented in a very particular time and place. It was invented by a Jesuit priest working in London in the aftermath, a French Jesuit priest in political exile from the French Revolution, which had, you know, uh, disestablished the church, abolished religious orders, persecuted the Catholic Church. He took refuge in London and trying to, um, in 1797, he published a book which tried to, if you like, give a simple explanation for the complete disorientation that the world felt at this seemingly accelerating upheaval caused by the French Revolution. And in seven volumes, collecting a crazy assemblage of evidence, he came up with a simple theory, which was it was all caused by conspiracy by the Freemasons. And that the Catholic Church had always been hostile to Freemasonry. The Pope excommunicated the Freemasons for the first time in 1738, and when he put the Inquisition on their trail, as we saw poor John Custos was one of the victims of those inquiries. Um, but in the 19th century, the, the idea that the Freemasons were responsible for everything bad about the modern world became the official ideology of the Catholic Church. There's no, there's no getting round it. The Catholic Church uh, thought the Freemasons were agents of Satan and that their um, aim was to abolish the church and abolish, create world anarchy. Um, and that theory, in turn, became um, a template for a remodeling of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Uh, uh, Jews uh, were, um, had already been hated and uh, suspected for, you know, religious as well as uh, racist reasons, but, but a new version of um, anti-Semitism, and even of a, the vision of the Judeo-Masonic plot, in which this new version of anti-Semitism, which Jews were scheming behind the scenes to control world affairs in secret cabals and controlling finance and so on, that version of the anti-Semitic conspiracy theory um, would... Uh, was very definitely modeled on Freemasonry, and it would go on to inform uh, the brutal persecution of Freemasons, although not quite as brutal as the Masons themselves claim, and thereby hangs a tale, by Europe's dictatorships, um, and not by, you know, Hitler, by Mussolini, by Generalissimo Franco, in Spain and other dictatorships, but across the communist world, Freemasonry is still banned in China, and also across the Muslim world. Uh, there are only two uh, countries in the Muslim world where Freemasonry is not banned, and it, uh, it, it's basically banned on the grounds that it is all uh, a Jewish or Western or CIA conspiracy. So, willy-nilly therefore freemasonry's influence can be felt right across world history in strange and unpredictable ways which you know the poor freemasons themselves have often got very little to do with uh and that's the story uh that i try to bring together in my book thanks for your patience thank you professor dickie that was awesome um <laughs> If you've got if you got a question, um, as we said at the at the top, use the chat feature down there. And I guess my first question is: is what drew you to this? I mean, was it um, uh, what? As somebody who studies Italy, yeah, um, was it the what 
was it the parallels to what you've studied before to, to what to study this what uh... well it, i mean there's a good a, a sort of funny story that hangs by that i mean as you know i i'm my um uh one of my areas of expertise is italy's mafia organizations i've written a number of um, historical works and academic articles and so on on, on Italy's mafia organizations and um, uh, and so I'm you know quoted in the media a lot and so on and uh, quite some years ago now um, a mafia boss was arrested on the outskirts of London and it's not something that happens every day in London we don't have that, have that many mafia bosses a guy had been on the run for ages and he was um, living a sort of under an assumed name uh, disguised as a sort of fairly humble limousine driver driving backwards and forwards between Heathrow Airport and the centre of London. Um, and he'd been on the run since 1993. He was the boss of the mafia family of Trabia, which is near Palermo, the Sicilian capital. So it was August. There was nothing in the news. It's what we call the silly season. So I was on pretty much every TV, radio, news channel, I spent a whole day and a half in the studios talking about what the mafia is. And, I, you know, I began, it was often, tell us what the mafia is. Well, I said, it's a bit like the Freemasons, only for criminals. That is indeed how members, many members of the Sicilian mafia who've turned state's evidence define it. They say, We're, well, think of us as like the Freemasons for criminals. And uh, when I got home, I got an email um, from the head of communications at the United Grand Lodge of England uh, saying, would you like to come into a chat for a chat? Because the Freemasons up and down England had phoned in to protest um, that I was comparing them to the Mafia. So uh, I did, of course, go along. I w went to the tour. I talked to the historian. And, I, and I, I realized there immediately, I think, that there was this... I already knew a little bit about um, uh, the history of Freemasonry, particularly from an Italian angle. And Italy has a very important role in the history of Freemasonry. Um, that's why I spend a fair bit of my book in there. You know, the United States occupies a fair bit of it. So does Britain and Italy. They're the major basis, if you like, although I go all over the place as well. Italy, because of the, anti the, ca the Catholic Church's long history of fear and suspicion of Freemasonry. F uh, Freemasonry was first repressed uh, by Mussolini in 1925, and also the whole there's a whole history of collusion between Freemasonry and uh, crime and subversion. The P2 story. There are also trials linking the uh, various mafia organisations to uh, to the Freemasons in Italy. So I knew a bit of this story, but then I realised, wow, you know this. You, what I got the sense was that you had a kind of dialogue of the deaf. That the Freemasons had their version of their history, which was a sort of noble tradition of brotherhood and so on and so forth. And that much of the rest of the world, particularly in Italy, but also in Britain, less so in the United States, where Freemasonry has a better reputation, I think, by and large, is regarded as less of a menace. People regard the Freemasons in Britain as a, a grubby, self, you know, self back scratching or mutual back scratching organization. People join the Masons, get a better job to get a contract that they wouldn't have got otherwise, that kind of thing. And these two versions of Freemasonry as noble tradition of brotherhood or as uh, uh, grubby cabal had never merged and, and had, had just defined people's perceptions, dominated the journalism, and there was this dialogue in the death. And I wanted to try and write a book that would both inform Freemasons, challenge the way they thought about Freemasonry, but also inform the rest of us. I'm a non-Mason myself. Those of us who are, you know, would never consider joining Freemasonry 
and you know maybe say hang on these guys have got an interesting story to tell there is you know something about freemasonry we need to take see, see seriously and find out more about so that was the story okay. what originally drew you you had mentioned earlier that um benjamin franklin was a big proponent and a big you know, big salesperson for yeah for, for this what drew him originally to it and why the what what caused the original uh, problem between the, the Catholic Church and Freemasonry? What, what was the impetus for that? Well, the fir first question first. The Catholic Church regarded itself as having a monopoly on truth. And any doctrine, any body that uh, regarded, it welcomed all comers, to express their religion uh, was guilty of heresy thereby, and quite possibly much worse. Because of the secrecy, we couldn't really know. If they are so honest, why are they secret? It must be because they're Satanists. You know, their um, um, uh, great architect of the universe, which is the Masonic sort of word expression for God, for the Almighty, must be Satan. It's a code word for Satan. And they were, the church was also afraid for political reasons. Remember the church in this period is also, the Pope is also a king. He has a kingdom. He has a, a realm. And it is, a, is an autocratic realm. And there is no democracy, there's no associations arrived. So people meeting in secret associations are by definition a threat. So that's the reason for the original hostility. And that's what's maintained through the centuries. Still to this day, um, the, the excommunication stands against um, Freemasonry. Uh, and your other question, well, I think Frank, people like Franklin and Washington were attracted to Freemasonry because even then it was a school of public virtue. It was a status symbol. It was a way to socialize with other like-minded men. Masonic lodges often became places that held meetings where they had lectures, where they pursued good causes. It was integral to public life. And, and the secrecy was... Freemason, Masonic secrecy has meant different things in different times and places or implied different things in different places. Freemasons were very open and public as they still often are you know they would hold public parades and mark their uh uh their their days their special days they two saint john's days one near christmas one in the in, in in june where they uh would hold parades and so on and show off that and both you know proclaim their role in public life in uh, uh american cities and that was exact you know that was happening in colonial society in exactly the same way that it was in british society at the time uh, why the aversion to women and in your book do you um have any information or research about the order of the eastern star the rainbow girls you know the 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 the, the female offshoot, if you will, there's um, what? Yeah. Um, the, the, why the aversion to women is interesting. In part, um, the issue is that women were excluded from everything anyway. Property, government, you know, social life. But it's not always, it's not that straightforward because there was a strong strand in Enlightenment thinking that women were a civilizing influence on men, that social life to be polite had to include women among the elite classes, of course. And so 
while in some senses when Freemasonry became codified in the 18th century in London, it was sort of automatic that um, women would be excluded, at the same time it did also attract trouble for Freemasons, that, you know, it attracted suspicion towards them. You know, right from the beginning, people were saying, ha, you're doing this because you're homosexuals. That was the, the accusation. And it still causes trouble this, to this day. Um, the United Grand Lodge of England, because Freemasonry fragmented very quickly into all kinds of traditions and codes and so on and so forth. And some of them began to admit women in various forms, usually subordinate forms. Um, the, uh, for example, in France, and this is a history I trace in some detail, France was really where this was pioneered. There were adoption lodges where women were allowed to become members alongside men. In the United States, you have the Order of the Eastern Star, which was originally founded for the relatives of, the female relatives of Freemasons, and members of the Order of uh, the Eastern Star uh, are not Freemasons, don't have, if you like, full membership. Uh, and, you know, some people might regard that as a little bit patronizing, if you like. It, it's a bit like, you know, a particular bar set aside for women, um, a mixed association in, in, in some very conservative golf clubs, uh, as they used to be. Um, so Freemasonry has always had this problem in, in just right up to the present day, um, where in France, uh, the United Grand Lodge, uh, sorry, the United, um, the, the Grand Orient of France, excuse me, which is the governing body of the main tradition of French Freemasonry, only really, when was it, in 2010? agreed to admit women for the first time in 250 years on exactly equal status to men and to have mixed lodges. And it only did so paradoxically when it was provoked uh, by the case of a fascinating uh, woman who I met and interviewed for my book, um, who uh, had joined the Freemasons as a man and then uh, had undergone a sex change, thus presenting the Freemasons with a problem and a very, <laughs> they had a very heated debate about this and eventually uh, said, oh look, the only way to solve this will just admit women. And now uh, roughly 20% of the applicants to join Freemasonry in uh, the Grand Orient are women. Um, so it still causes division. Uh, it's still some Masonic traditions won't recognize others as proper Freemasons because they allow women to be, you know, they have mixed lodges and that kind of, of thing. So it's a, it's a persistent uh, problem and one that I uh, do trace a little bit in, uh, in my book. Hmm. Well, uh, looking at some of the questions here, and I, and um, uh, I can see sense a little mini theme, and I'm wondering if, with the recent um, discussions about the Knights Templar, Da Vinci Code, things like mm. that, has it has that shown a different kind of light on Freemasonry? Do people want to know about the 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 relationship between this group and the Freemasons, that group and the Freemasons? Is, is, that, uh, is that fair to yeah. say? And, and I mean, this has always been the case. You know, the, the, the Freemasons are fabulous at creating mythical histories for themselves. Remember I mentioned earlier that they integrate all kinds of symbols into their rituals. And they keep, you know, particularly early in history, they generated more and more and more and more rituals with ever new symbols and so on. And those symbols came from all kinds of things. Um, a mythical history about, you know, the, 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 the most important one was the mythical 
their mythical origins uh, of among the builders of King Solomon's temple in the Bible. That is a myth. A myth, a very important myth for Freemasons created in the 18th century was the idea that the origins went back to the Crusaders and particularly to the Knights Templar. Because that brought with it a whole baggage of symbolism, suits of armor and swords and you name it, yeah? And they would, you know, ancient Egypt, the the Kabbalah, um, you name it, you know, they, they brought in all of these different symbols. Um, and those symbols and those myths associated have often been mistaken for history. Uh, many, many Masonic histories would sort of confuse this myth making with the real history. Um, now, partly because of, the, and this is true both of Freemasons and um, uh, Freemasonry's enemies. You know, that one of the reasons, that, you know, many church scholars in the 19th century would trace the origins of Freemasonry by following the history of various heresies, uh, you know, right back to the early origins of Christianity, the first heretics. They are the inheritors of the first uh, heretics, if you like. Um, and when Dan Brown uh, published the uh, Da Vinci Code, that of course created huge problems for the Catholic Church. It unleashed an army of cranks uh, on, on the Catholic Church. And when it was announced that Dan Brown's sequel to uh, the uh, Da Vinci Code uh, which the name escapes me now. I've read it. It's not bad, actually, all things considered. The, um, um, what's it called? Is that Angels I, and Demons? Or? No, no, it's, um, that was before and, and then republished afterwards. It, it was then the biggest book launch ever. You know, something crazy like six million advanced copies or something. It was due to come up, and it was about Freemasonry. What the heck is it about forgive me i will i i it'll come to me uh the lost symbol that's what it's called um and this scent uh, and, and its climactic scene is um set in the headquarters of the scottish right of freemasonry the southern jurisdiction the scottish right in washington dc this gigantic kind of temple based on one of the seven wonders of the ancient world in Washington, D.C. And Masons were terrified that they were going to get the same uh, army of cranks unleashed on them. And, you know, the conspiracy theorists were going to go wild. Uh, so there was a state of panic uh, in Freemasonry. But in the end... Uh, actually, the book gives Freemasons a very, very good press. And without any spoilers, if you haven't read the book, uh, which is, is uh, it, 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 um, uh, I was going to say it's not bad, not bad for Dan Brown, shall we say. Um, in the end, it gives the Freemasons a very good press, and it's only the bad guy who believes the Masonic conspiracy theories, who believes that the Masons are all powerful and hiding some secret. Uh, and the Masons are made to look pretty good. You know, one of the heroes of the story is a Freemason. So, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it has created panics around Freemasonry, uh, you know, repeatedly through its history. What's the current status of Freemasonry? Is it numbers increasing? Are they decreasing? Depends where you go. In the United States, Freemasonry is declining in numbers. I, one of the chapters of my book in, is set in New York, um, the time of the, the World's Fair in Queens in, in 64, 65, when there was a great Masonic exhibition there. And that really was the, the apogee of Freemasonry's influence in American public life. 
there were some there were over four million freemasons at that time which when you consider that freemasonry is quite expensive hobby you know the fees the buying all the the jewelry and the costumes and all that kind of stuff you know it, it it it's only for people above a certain income bracket this is another paradoxical thing about its universal values it also excludes uh, you know catholics are often very reluctant to join freemasonry have a traditional suspicion of it you know pretty much it it, it was standard for a, you know a, a, a wasp uh, american middle class man to be a freemason at that time and that's not even including all of the other masonic uh, all of the other fraternal organizations for which freemasonry was the original influence that the, the root of all this vast spreading branch of american fraternal organizations again this is a story i tell in the book you know that that is it's a uniquely american proliferation of the moose and the elks and the rotary club and you name it uh all of them closely based on freemasonry freemasons were everywhere so many famous freemason freemasons in that era astronauts you know the buzz aldrins and people and uh arnold palmer and audie murphy you know endless names you could come up with um masonic presidents of course you know probably the most um uh, but Americans have got used to having a Freemason uh, as president uh, at that stage. Uh, the last of the 14 Masonic presidents was Gerald Ford. Um, from that point, Freemasonry has gone into steady, steady decline. There are now about a million uh, although exact numbers are difficult to come by. And we could talk about the reasons for that decline, but it's a graying organization and its ranks are thinning. But one million is still pretty impressive. Um, and there are other parts of the world. We think there may be about six million across the world. There are other parts of the world where Freemasonry is growing. Some parts of Italy, the Grand Orient in France, now that it's admitting women, seems to be growing. Some African countries, it's growing. So it's a mixed picture. Um, and I can go into the reasons for that. Uh, but it's still, for all that, has tremendous imaginative, imaginative power and still has some remarkable stories to tell. Um couple one, couple last questions here um of the groups that you mentioned are the shriners um yeah. connected with the freemasons in any way and the presidents you just mentioned is it true that franklin roosevelt had something to do with the putting in a masonic symbol in the dollar bill <laughs> okay yeah the shriners that you have to be a freemason to join the shriners the the freemasons because they are the great joiners you know the great members of clubs and fraternities have generated all kinds of branch off associations among the the, the shriners being one of the most popular yeah so the, the it's sometimes referred to as the sort of playground for freemasons the shriners um and yeah the 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 famous masonic symbol the eye in the pyramid on uh the uh, dollar bill that's the, the it's the story uh, a, a story i tell uh, again in the book now it, it it of course comes from the great seal of the united states the sort of obverse of that which had, was created there's no evidence that it was put in originally uh during the very early years of the republic uh as a masonic symbol in fact it wasn't a masonic symbol at that stage it hadn't yet been adopted the, the pyramid was simply a symbol of, of uh, the United States, the original states. I think there were 
that many layers of its solidity of its ability to last through the ages and the all-seeing eye was an image of divine providence overseeing it so it was you know a, a, a kind of metaphor for the new America if you like it subsequently like so many other symbols was hoovered up by the Freemasons for use in their rituals and it made it onto the dollar bill in the 1930s during a uh, under Roosevelt uh, FDR um, when the dollar bill underwent a redesign and originally what attracted uh, Roosevelt to it was not that he was a 32nd degree Freemason was not um, the um, uh, the fact that it was a Masonic symbol it was the motto underneath Novus Ordo Seclorum a new order for the ages this is the the, the, the motto that the, the conspiracy theorists say ah you see they want to create a new world order it says there in Latin um, he thought that that sounded a bit like New Deal and so it was a good way of sneakily getting his political slogan onto the do dollar bill. And he was actually worried that putting a Masonic symbol on the dollar bill would put off his Catholic voters. Um, and it was only, I think, when a Catholic member of his cabinet, I think his agricultural secretary, whose name I forget at the time, said, look, honestly, nobody will be bothered, really. You know, it's all a bit obscure. Don't worry. Put it on. Uh, he went ahead and, uh, and, and put it on uh, the dollar bill. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one theory. Or... The other theory is uh, that it's the Illuminati who've controlled the United States of America from the beginning and uh, have, uh, have revealed their conspiracy only to a few uh, hundred million Americans on the dollar bill. Well, <laughs> thank you very much for staying up late and doing this from London. And um, uh, this this has been awesome. And uh, I, I greatly appreciate it. The The name of the book is The Craft. And his name is John Dickey. Um, uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, not, not the world's greatest weather night. And thank you for staying up. This has been a, a real treat, a real honor. Well, thank you so much for your great questions and for being such a great audience. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. I wish I could be there with you. That would be uh, lovely, but um, it wasn't to be. So, uh, yeah, enjoy. And do if you do pick up the book, do let me know what you make of it. I'm easy to find, uh, you know, on the Internet via my university or my website or whatever. All right. Well, good luck with this book. Thank you for joining us. Um, hopefully this was good practice to stay up for the Super Bowl. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, um, good luck, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, stay safe. Good night.